Well, obviously, a lot of people were very curious heading into the uh, budget on the roadmap for the economy and issues like productivity. Our next guest thinks that the capital gains tax hike, which was just outlined in that report, uh, ultimately has the government going after those who save in the country. And that will have implications for tax planning, uh, family investment decisions, and that big long-term issue of productivity. Derek Holt is the Vice President and Head of Capital Markets Economics at Scotiabank. He joins us now. Derek, uh, why don't you lean a little bit more into that concern that you've uh, felt in reaction to this update from the federal government? Sure. Okay. So, uh, good good starting point, John. So, let's start backwards here. We need high, faster productivity growth. To get that, we need more investment. And in order to get more investment, we need to generate savings and or go into deeper hawk to uh, external creditors. And so, to generating domestic savings is extremely important, and we're not very good at that. The relatively few who do save are the relatively upper income households. The lower to bottom three quintiles and on an income distribution basis dissave on net. And so what we're doing here is going after the people who are generating the savings that could back uh, investment and back productivity gains. Uh, those upper income cohorts are the ones that indeed hold the capital gains. But what we're doing now is compounding government taxation at every single stage of the value creation uh, chain. And so think about it. When you uh, pay taxes upon your workforce earnings and invest them, the after-tax earnings in a company, you hope to generate some profits out of that company and some capital gains. The company gets taxed. The company invests some of those after-tax earnings in, cap in things that they hope will generate capital gains that are now going to be taxed at a higher rate. Going forward, anything that's left over gets distributed to shareholders either through dividends and or uh, capital gains themselves, and now people are going to be taxed yet again. So this whole fairness argument is ex extremely misleading. It is an extremely unfair uh, method of taxation to combat compound the taxation at every single stage of the, um, the investment process. And what Canada has done here has made itself severely less competitive compared to other jurisdictions. We will have among the highest capital gains tax rates anywhere in the world after we've already lost our corporate tax advantage compared to the United States about six years ago. That's no way to generate investment savings and productivity. So just to lean more into that, like what are the ramifications of being less competitive? What does that mean in terms of the money flows? Sure. Okay. No. Good. Good point. So over time, if we're going to close the widening gap on living standards compared to countries like the United States, where we have fallen behind for a very long period of time, we need to generate faster income, faster uh, investment, faster productivity growth. You don't do it by penalizing the people who are providing the savings for that investment and the, and those uh, capital gains in the first place. And so what we've done is taken a step back here in terms of any hope to to. Uh, address our longer run living standards in Canada. And, um, uh, you know, I guess if, if you were to have proposed uh, another solution for addressing these issues and, you know, in a, in a balanced way that addresses these issues that everybody's talking about, like affordability, but fairness as well, what would be your solution? Well, my solution would have been to toe the line on program spending. I think Minister Freeland is the, the heaviest spending finance minister we've had in decades. And at the margin, that's the reason why they introduced this tax on savings. Uh, about $7 billion, there's a reason why they chose that number. It's a magical number. It allows the minister to continue to say that she will uh, keep the deficit for the concluding fiscal year at $40.1 billion. It's a magical number that achieves that. And so they had to dip into not only taxing uh, profit and taxing income at a relatively high rate in Canada, they're, they're now taxing savings in order to divert that towards short-term program spending. I think this country is on the wrong track fundamentally. I think we're engaged in too much here today, gone tomorrow kind of consumption across households, across housing markets, across government spending, and we're not doing anything to address our longer run competitiveness challenges that are growing more acute by the year. And what about the issue of the next generation? Uh, are there ramifications from the current fiscal picture that we have uh, going forward? I heard a lot of people sort of asking that question yesterday online. 
It's, it's a good point, John, because this whole budget was billed as being fair to the younger people and redistributing some proceeds to help them out and address housing affordability. At the end of the day, though, we're cementing $65 billion a year in interest charges over the forecast horizon by the time we're into the third, fourth, fifth years out from now. Uh, massive increase. That's a structural deficit. That's going to compound the indebtedness of the country over time. And therefore, that comes at the expense of the future generation. So in my opinion, they're patently misleading in terms of what they are saying to younger voters right now, because they're the ones who are going to be on uh, footing the bill for, for this indebtedness in, in years future. All right, Derek, good to get